In this final lesson looking at the subject of fraud, what I'm going to do is talk about fraud by abuse of position. This is the third and final uh, method by which fraud could take place. And just like with the other two, keep in mind the fact that there is quite significant and extensive linkages between this subject, this idea, and the subjects and ideas that we discussed when we looked at theft. There was also a lot of discussions and linkages between the idea of fraud by abusive position and the idea of all of the other fraud offences that we've previously examined in other lessons. So the focus in this lesson is going to be on section four of the Fraud Act. This is fraud by abuse of position. Now, technically, I've, I've already made this very, uh, point very clear, but I then have written in the uh, presentation um, that uh, fraud is technically denoting multiple different crimes. Each of them share great many similarities and all share similarities and principles we studied when we looked at the crime of theft. This is something that I've been speaking about multiple times throughout this series of lessons. And one of the reasons why I think it's important to do this is because it, it, it sort of defangs the, the severity or at least the, the, the amount of com, uh, convoluted and complicated issues that you might need to think about when looking at fraud. Because fundamentally, if you think of fraud as three different and subjectively, uh, and subjectively distinct offences, then you might be a bit intimidated by the subject of fraud, or you might be a bit intimidated by studying fraud uh, and when it comes to revising this subject. But if you just think about it as three of the same offences technically, uh, but with some ever so slight minor uh, differences, uh, especially relating to the fact, uh, at the act, sorry, in terms of commission, then it sort of reduces the uh, extent to which fraud is considered to be such a scary and difficult offence to study. Uh, and then if you then think about how the, how it links so closely with theft, then theft and fraud, the two crimes together, while representing quite a significant amount of study time on this series and in any textbook, actually uh, is reduced down to some of just the most key and basic principles of dishonesty, of appropriation, of things like uh, things like intent, all of which are very, very uh, important elements. So we're going to start by just reading through the legislation, which is section four of the 2006 Fraud Act. A person is in breach of this section if he occupies a position in which he is expected to safeguard or not to act against financial interests of another person. They dishonestly abuse that position and intend by means of abuse of that position to make a gain for himself or another, to cause loss to another or expose another to a risk of loss. A person may be regarded as having abused this, his position, even though his conduct consisted of an omission rather than an act. So subsection 2 just tells us that it is act and omissions based. Now, fundamentally, this is very similar to the other two examples. The mens rea for fraud by abuse of position is essentially exactly the same. It requires a certain amount of dishonesty and it requires a certain amount of intention to uh, make a gain for himself or another or to cause loss to another or to expose another to a risk of loss. Both of those are the same as sections three and sections two. The difference, of course, is the actus reus of this offence, the idea of occupying first a position in which you are expected to safeguard and to not act against the financial interest of another person, and then secondly, to abuse that position. Those are the two actus reus elements. You have to do so, of course, with an element of dishonesty, and you have to do so with an intent to, to make a gain or to cause loss. Now, very quickly then, let's just think of an example from the case law, because fundamentally, this is this is a relatively straightforward area of the law. Um, there's not really that much to go off in terms of understanding what fraud is and what fraud isn't. Uh, fundamentally, it is very similar to that of theft. And once you've studied the, the groundworks of this subject, the study of theft, uh, you fundamentally, um, if you know what theft is, you can basically come to a conclusion as to what fraud is quite easily. So let's talk about the case here. OK. Uh, this is the case of Crown versus Value Jeeves or Value Jeeves um, from 2014. 
It was a case which involved a number of labour suppliers, and these labour suppliers had made a number of just unjustified, sorry, dedication uh, did, uh, deductions in pay, as well as unjustified fines and warranties. That's a, a typo there, deductions in pay, rather than de dedications in pay. Um, these were unjustified fines and also a number of warranties. They were, as a result of these unjustified deductions and fines and warranties, in fact charged under Section 4 of the Fraud Act for, as you can guess, obviously, for fraud by abuse of position. This was, however, appealed since it was argued that there was no expectation for an unlicensed labour supplier to safeguard the financial interests of their workers. So they challenged the charge of Section 4 on the basis that there was not an expectation to safeguard the financial interests of their workers. And so as a result of which they did not have this abuse by abuse of position um, uh, uh, relationship between those who are the victims of this offence and those who are the perpetrators. So if we go back to the Fraud Act itself, they argued that they did not satisfy uh, subsection 1A the occupying a position in which you are expected to safeguard or not act against the financial interests of another person. Now, this was an argument that was, uh, however, rejected by the Court of Appeal. And what this case shows is that there are situations where a breach can take place that isn't one of a fiduciary relationship, but it could still therefore be covered under Section 4 of the Act. So they were still found um, to have um, committed fraud by abusive position. And what I mean here, of course, by fiduciary relationship is just simply a relationship of trust and confidence. Um, this is a kind of relationship that you can see in various different circumstances. Uh, if when you study, if and when you study the law of trusts, for example, you will cover the idea of a fiduciary relationship. The trustee, for example, has a fiduciary relationship and a fiduciary obligation to the beneficiaries under the trust. In addition to this, you can think about other kinds of relationships which may be fiduciary in nature, such as, for example, a client and a solicitor, an accountant and a, and a client, a doctor and a patient, all of which are relationships of trust and confidence. What this case illustrates, though, is that Section 4 of the Act, when they go and they say that you occupy a position in which you are expected to safeguard or not act against the financial interests of another person, that is not suggesting that they are exclusively talking about a fiduciary relationship. You can still occupy a position in which you are expected to safeguard while also not being a fiduciary, uh, having a fiduciary relationship with the victims of this offence.